environmental projects, including digital citizenship education, and more recently, uh, artificial intelligence and education. Uh, here at the Council of Europe uh, Education Department, we develop policy instruments that guide the development of uh, education policies and practices in our member 46 member states. And a little bit about the Council of Europe. Uh, as the leading human rights organization in Europe, we protect human rights, democracy, and the rule of law. So in the context of education, we work really hard to make sure that everyone, uh, at least in the Council of Europe uh, territory or uh, in the member states has access uh, to education or they enjoy the right to education uh, to the uh, uh, largest extent possible. And uh, today I invite you to learn about uh, the Council of Europe's work on digital citizenship education and have a fruitful discussion on how digital citizenship education can contribute to promoting democratic culture online. In this forum, the members of the Council of Europe's uh, Digital Citizenship uh, Education Expert Group will present you some of our leading initiatives. And uh, this include uh, Brian O'Neill, who will discuss the incorporation of the uh, Council of Europe's Committee of Ministers recommendation on developing and promoting digital citizenship education and its principles uh, into uh, the its principles uh, incorporation of its principles into or recent guidelines to promote to support equitable partnerships of education institutions and the private sector and then uh, another member of our uh, expert group uh, alessandro soriani will present how video game culture has been deployed as cultural tools to promote and practice digital citizenship as described in the recommendation. He will be followed by Janice Richardson, who will report on how parents' organizations have been mobilized as digital citizenship promoters within the context of the recommendation again. And finally, we will hear about how uh, digital citizenship education can help us to tackle this information from Vitor Tome. And we have also to other distinguished uh, members of the uh, expert group, Olena Stajslavska and Nezir Akeshilman, uh, who Olena will be uh, co-moderating with me the online participation and Nezir will, uh, pro, uh, will take note of this uh, open forum. Okay, so before giving the floor to our distinguished experts, I would like to say a few words of, uh, uh, the, uh, on the role of citizens in the internet governance uh, and then the competences they need to contribute to the uh, governance of internet overall. And uh, in my opinion, the governance is twofold. So you have the governing bodies and you have the citizens and the governing bodies are supposed to work for citizens. But when it comes to governance and or democratic governance of any structure, that we are talking about active participation and involvement of all citizens, regardless their status, regardless they, their uh, gender, origin, uh, ethnicity, etc. So this is particularly important because when it comes to governance, we usually tend to expect much from the governing bodies, but uh, as citizens, we should also take uh, an active role to contribute and, but for this, we need to develop a set of competences uh, to, to, to make our participation more efficient and also more meaningful. And in this regard, I would like to recall the Council of Europe's reference framework of competences for democratic culture. Maybe, uh, yes, thank you, Brian. Uh, as you see on the screen, uh, this, this reference framework or the competence scheme uh, covers four areas, uh, values, attitudes, skills, knowledge, and critical understanding. I'm not going to uh, list all those competencies, but as you see, generally, the, you will see schemes that include skills, mainly knowledge and critical understanding or critical thinking, attitudes a little bit, but values is, is missing uh, in many schemes. So this is, uh, I might say, uh, the Council of Europe contribution is, is that we bring together all these four aspects 
and then what we call competence that you need to have a, a little bit of all of this uh, and uh, to 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 some extent to be able to uh, responsibly and actively participate in um, in in society and also to contribute building a culture of democracy and as i said you know governance means there are systems structures mechanism but what about the culture so you can have a parliament and in many countries we have parliaments but unless there's a culture of democracy those do not function democratically uh, it looks like democratic but when it comes to practical uh, implications uh, we need to we need to have this uh, culture the, the 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 culture of democracy internalized by all citizens in our daily lives uh, in in school in society at home or at uh, workplace that way we can contribute uh, to the to the uh, democratic governance of our societies and when it comes to digital participation or digital governance or internet governance and there is a trend uh, and, and you know general trend that uh, everybody thinks that we should have digital skills digital competences yes oh definitely but in addition to those competences we also need have uh, we need to have or we need to develop those competences that you are seeing on the screen to add purpose or meaning to to the digital competencies we have i always give this example you know we can make really good coders very perfect coders but it comes to the point that for what purpose you are using your coding skills or competence are you to hack the banks or are you uh, meant to use those competences for the common good for the benefits of uh, others and citizens so i mean i don't want to go on and on this way i'm very cautious about the time so i will pass the floor uh, to brian to uh, to 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 present uh, a little bit of our recommendation and uh, then how those recommendation principles are applied in our uh, recent guidelines thank you very much for your attention brian Thank you very much, Murat. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. I am delighted to, to be able to join you remotely uh, from Dublin. And as Murat has said, uh, I'd like to introduce another uh, strand uh, of our project on uh, uh, di digital citizenship uh, education. Again, I'll just share my screen uh, just uh, to be able to illustrate uh, some of the features uh, of uh, the work uh, that is included within this. And this particular strand, we're relates to uh, guidelines that we have developed uh, to support partnerships between education institutions and the private sector. And uh, this, uh, uh, the purpose of uh, developing uh, this uh, uh, resource uh, was really to try and assist what we know to be uh, a whole host of uh, individual arrangements whereby schools and education institutions and educators generally are greatly relying on uh, digital technologies, but often have little guidance uh, as in terms uh, of what is most appropriate and suitable and what actually fulfills uh, their objectives in terms of fostering uh, these competences uh, that uh, Murat has uh, referred to. And uh, equally for the purpose of uh, the private sector, uh, what uh, likewise can be their uh, navigational aid in terms of you know, what are the educational objectives of what are we trying to achieve uh, within a, a democratic environment, uh, within a school setting, or within an education setting. So that's the purpose of having developed uh, this particular resource. And uh, the inspiration for this uh, was in fact uh, the recommendation of uh, the, uh, the Council of Europe uh, adopted by the Council of Ministers uh, in 2019 on digital citizenship education and this uh, wide-ranging uh, political support uh, uh, guiding and advising all member states uh, to update their frameworks uh, to adopt 
uh, digital citizenship, uh, specifically focused on the potential of partnerships. And it encouraged the cooperation between public, uh, private and civil society sectors uh, so that uh, they are working together constructively where the opportunities arise uh, to develop uh, new initiatives that will support uh, a culture of uh, democracy. So hence uh, our focus on the idea of a partnership and a partnership where there will be uh, guidance as to what uh, the expectations are from each side and that through the, this partnership uh, that uh, sustainable high quality education is possible. Um, underpinning this is a belief that uh, it is a collective and multi-stakeholder effort and uh, that uh, when uh, young people in education settings are engaging in the digital environment, uh, that uh, democratic participation should be to the forefront. And we want to enlist the private sector as part of this initiative. So this is the idea of developing a resource uh, to actually guide this. And as part of our project, uh, the way in which we mobilize this is to develop um, a guidance, recommendations, case studies, examples across the full range and the full spectrum of opportunities uh, in the digital uh, arena. We refer to these as the 10 digital domains, and it encompasses such areas as access, learning, media and information literacy, of course, but we also focus on uh, active participation and the quality of that participation uh, 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 described as well-being online. And of course, uh, we are underpinned uh, by uh, principles of dem uh, democracy and democratic culture. So with a focus on rights online uh, that uh, will underline rights and responsibilities, uh, questions uh, in relation to the appropriate levels of safety and security and awareness of the environment in which uh, 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 we operate. So our resource, and uh, very happy to share this as part of uh, the full toolkit uh, which uh, our project offers. It includes explainers uh, about each of these dimensions. It sets out goals uh, for what uh, a partnership should seek to achieve. Uh, it gives guidelines uh, for good practice and it focuses on areas where innovation and where new technologies create new opportunities to, uh, to develop um, uh, uh, practical ways in which to implement uh, democratic principles. As this project is relatively new, uh, we have issued and published our guidelines on the website of the Council of Europe. Uh, we have also committed uh, to monitor this and to be able to use the lessons learned uh, as a means of uh, communicating progress. How are partnerships actually developing? What good practices are they developing? And through the process of this, whereby uh, we are asking all uh, partners subscribing to this project uh, to develop a statement of commitment uh, and uh, to describe what exactly uh, they are committing to and what they are developing in support of uh, digital citizenship uh, education. And through this, uh, we hope to build up a repository of uh, good practice, of sense-making practices uh, that can be widely uh, disseminated. For us, uh, the uh, importance of this particular initiative is that it places digital citizenship and competences for democratic culture right at the heart of of digital transformation as it impacts so many people in education settings. Uh, remember that uh, we are encouraging and fostering uh, lots of ways in which uh, digital technologies can transform education, but we want to ensure through this uh, initiative uh, that uh, democratic uh, competences are at the very forefront uh, of this. And when uh, uh, technology is deployed, that it is also a learning opportunity to acquire these competences. I'll stop sharing there and uh, very happy to um, uh, uh, discuss further these elements. But for the moment, I'll just hand back to Murat. Thank you, Brian. Thank you very much. Um, as you see, I mean, uh, I mentioned uh, about policy instruments that we are developing policy instruments, but uh, uh, those are not uh, meant to um, uh, sit on the shelves or the, those are not meant to be just listed in a repository of policy instruments but to be to be implemented so 
and uh, to put it in the context, to be put in the context, that's uh, uh, in this respect, I appreciate what uh, Brian just uh, uh, presented. Uh, he has been leading this process, the guidelines, and uh, private companies or private partners uh, are really uh, uh, vital in overall in the success on access to education or success in education nowadays because they are also driving uh, driving forces of educational technologies which we have we are increasingly rely on uh, for the delivery of education. Now I would like to pass the floor to Alessandro Soriani from University of Bologna. And by the way, I forgot to mention about our on-site moderator, Afia Fed, who kindly accepted to, to, to help us moderating this session uh, in Addis Ababa as we are all online and uh, couldn't come to there. Uh, thank you, for Afia, for this. And then uh, before giving the floor to Alessandro, uh, the video games, I mean, it's a, it's a phenomenon which Alessandro will uh, talk about uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in, in a few minutes that, you know, how we can link it to uh, democratic citizenship or democratic participation and how we can link it to overall to governance. I think this is a key question. Uh, and then I believe, or we believe at the council that uh, developing a video game culture can really contribute uh, to achieve, uh, um, you know, uh, increasing or improving uh, digital competences of learners and their participation and some other competences like empathy. Uh, without further ado, I would like to pass the floor to Alessandro. Thank you very much. Uh, for some reason, I am not um, authorized to share my video nor my screen. Um, so if if uh, Brian uh, would kindly share the screen with my presentation, it would be really appreciated. Thank you very much. Um, I'm so sorry that uh, that I, I I can't switch on my camera. So uh, thanks uh, thanks for the uh, thanks Brian, thanks Murat, and thanks to all the people that are listening to this panel. Uh, it's an honor for me to being part of this panel and um, tell a little bit what will be uh, what what this action of the project is about. Um, so uh what the okay maybe maybe i okay i'm here <laughs> good morning <laughs> or good afternoon uh so why why talking about video games in uh, in uh, in the digital citizenship education project was uh sort of the question that murat um, passed passed to me well video game are um one of the most popular entertainment industry in the world and not only popular uh, one of the most uh, um, um sorry brian i i we are, we are seeing your screen okay <laughs> if you can go back one slide okay thanks so video games uh, as i said there was one of the most popular entertainment industry but also one of the um uh wealthiest uh, uh, industry um uh, in the world uh, uh with much more incomes uh, than uh, the hollywood for instance and the, the the movies and it's possible to play almost everywhere and almost anytime and on almost uh, any kind of device and everywhere so uh even on portable phones uh, on um, on um VR uh, goggles, it's, it's also possible to, to, to play some games. Video games, of, of course, are fun, engaging and designed to capture players' attention. And these factors brings, uh, bring new opportunities, but also new challenges in the, in the education and in the development of the children, young people and people in general. Uh, next slide. Uh, being a digital citizen, it means, among the other things uh, that have been already mentioned by uh, my colleagues, 
It means being able to benefit wisely from the different forms of entertainment that technology allow by properly balancing one's own media diet also. But educating for a video game culture means much more than this. Uh, it means, next slide. It means uh, uh, generating and nurturing a pedagogical reflection about video games. It means thinking about video games as a cultural tool able to offer many incentives, uh, not only to entertainment, but also to thinking, to learning and the development of the person in general. And it means also considering the video game worthy of being the object of study of an accurate and careful analysis of its characteristics, its mechanics and its languages. So it's, uh, uh, in other words, another slide, it means, uh, uh, next slide, please. It means uh, uh, considering the video game uh, as an into uh, as uh, as a resource for education and a resource for being an exercise uh, uh, one's own uh, um, digital citizenship. Uh, the aim of the initiative, so within the framework of the digital citizenship education project, uh, um, I am running this initiative about video game culture. Um, and the aim of this initiative is uh, exploring the implication that video games have on digital citizenship education and nurture a critical dialogue about video games, which includes the medium itself, the risks, of course, the educational potentials and the connection with nowadays challenges. Uh, to give some examples, climate change, uh, war, um, migrants, uh, and etc. Thanks. Uh, next slide, please. Um, to If you are interested more in learning about this uh, initiative, uh, you can go on the website of the Council of Europe and look for this publication, which is called Educating for a Video Game Culture. And it's a sort of introductory publication specifically dedicated to teachers and parents to let them understand the complexity of the medium uh, along with uh, potential risks and potential benefits that, that are connected uh, to, to the use of this medium. Uh, next slide. Um, okay, uh, I, I'm, I'm finished. Mo um, okay, sorry. So the, the idea is to consider video game as a, as a comprehensive resource uh, for the development of the current and future uh, citizens and uh, um, to um, better um, give you some example about the educational potential, we identified the four approaches uh, that um, um, can explain better how video game uh, can, can be used in educational uh, pathways. So there's a more direct approach, which means using video games and serious games to foster and facilitate players learning uh, or uh, the development of some competencies. There is a more indirect approach, um, uh, use, which means using video games to make players be passionate about a topic so that they will autonomously uh, go and, and learn about it. There is a more critical approach, which is the most complex one uh, in terms of possibilities also, because it means using video games to make players reflect about um, specific uh, topics approached by these games, or also uh, about their own practice. Uh, for instance, one of the um, approaches that may go under this, this uh, example would be using uh, uh, video games to uh, discuss about uh, uh, human rights uh, in, uh, in during war times, for instance, uh, very uh, very very interesting. And finally, the creative approach. It means uh, uh, using the potentials the potentials of video games to express one's own creativity. There are some video games that allow players to uh, create new things, create also new levels, but also create tools to create games themselves. And so these was uh, these were just a few examples of uh, um, the the philosophy of this of this initiative. I would be happy to answer for more questions in case the audience uh, have one. I have some. So thanks for listening. And I hope I didn't steal too much time. 
Thank you, Alessandro. Thank you very much for explaining how video game culture can contribute to develop digital citizenship. Uh, you gave an example, you know, that they can be used to discuss about human rights uh, or the contemporary issues we are facing, like climate change or uh, migration. I mean, those are all uh, in the in the current uh, uh, agenda of uh, the citizens and countries. Uh, and then, you know, we need to find the really uh, various and innovative ways to be able to discuss that in the in the education context and uh, even at home. Without further ado, I would like to pass the floor to Janice Richardson. Janice Richardson is a member of our, uh, and then one of the leading experts of DC expert group of the Council of Europe, but she has uh, many different roles uh, in the uh, international arena, including uh, sitting in the advisory boards of some big tech companies and also defending children's rights. And she will uh, talk about uh, the role of parents and how they can contribute to the development of digital citizenship. Janice, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, good evening. I'm calling in from Australia. I think the parents are one of the stakeholder groups that are really overlooked when we're talking about internet governance. But what, what do we expect of digital citizens? How would we define a digital citizen? And I think that Brian is going to show my slides now. First of all, a digital citizen has to be a lifelong learner. And this is just so important when you consider internet governance. But secondly, a digital citizen needs values, needs the attitudes that Murat spoke about earlier, because they need to be competent, active, engagers, uh, both with digital technologies, but also in making decisions in the community, in society. Parents have a very big role in this. Also, the respect of human rights, the respect of human dignity, absolutely essential. But where do children learn this? They learn this in the home. Next slide, please. Parents work with us in three ways, I would say, in particular. First of all, they are our guides. They help us understand the environment, understand the challenges and the opportunities that young people encounter in the world. Recently, we did a survey, 21,000 parents responded and described to us the very big issues that they're encountering. Secondly, role models. Parents are role models. They show young children how to interact in society, and they themselves are the ones who are shaping society. But thirdly, they're multipliers. We're working with many parent organizations across Europe to disseminate information, and you've got a glimpse of some of the tools that we've developed earlier, and also to multiply impact. Next slide, please. What do we aim to do? Well, first of all, we need to build the capabilities of individuals so that they can work together if we're going to shape peaceful, just and sustainable futures. We need to sustain and benefit from many different ways of knowing and being. And one of the big challenges of digital technology is the lack of pluralism. We need to counteract the backsliding and democratic governance through active citizen participation and activism and realize the transformative power of digital technology. But there are, of course, challenges and Digital citizenship aims to overcome the challenges of AI, of automation, and of the structural changes that are happening. And of course, to do all of these things, we need to focus on the four essential pillars of education, learning to know which in the Council of Europe uh, framework for democratic culture is knowledge and critical thinking, learn to do and these are the skills, learn to be, and this is about values. And finally, learning to live together. How do we develop those attitudes so that we can 
have a very solid internet governance. What are parents concerned about? Well, they're very much the concerns that you're speaking right now about in your meeting. They're concerned about fake news, privacy, hate speech, bullying. All of these are issues that we need to tackle in internet governance, but every one of us needs to be aware of and needs to tackle in our own home, with our own families and with our community. I pass the floor back to you, Murat. Thank you, Janice. Thank you very much for this uh, uh, valuable presentation. Uh, yeah, we see in the uh, word cloud, uh, the parents' concerns, you know, privacy, fake news, etc. Uh, but also, uh, I didn't mention about the overall or concept of digital citizenship is more like shifting the focus from protection and safety to empowerment, which was uh, spelled out before. Is that, okay, we, we need to protect our children, we need to protect our citizens the, for the governments, uh, I would say, but also they need to be empowered. So when there are situations that they have to tackle the, the issues on their own, they, are, they, they, they have the capacity, they have the competence to do so. And uh, regarding the parents, uh, yes, I mean, Janice mentioned that the digital activity uh, mainly uh, takes place at home, not uh, in school in many countries. Therefore, uh, overall in the conventional education systems, parents had a role, but now they have an increasing role in their children's uh, education, but also their life journey uh, becoming a digital citizen. So uh, now I will pass the floor to uh, Vitor Tome. He is also a member of our DCA expert, uh, digital citizenship education expert group. He works mainly on media and information literacy, and uh, he will talk about tackling disinformation uh, through digital citizenship education. Vitor, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, uh, uh, Murat. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening from in greetings from Lisbon, uh, Portugal. So Brian, can you please share uh, the slides, uh, please? Okay, thank you very much. So uh, my uh, short talk is about the tackling disinformation and how we can uh, tackle this information to digital citizenship education. Uh, next slide, please. So disinformation means false or misleading information that is spread deliberately with the intention of deceiving the public. It can assume different uh, areas such so disinformation, misinformation or malinformation, but in general, the main uh, idea is that it's deliberately uh, spread with the intention to deceiving the public. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, regarding the re results from the Eurobarometer uh, uh, Media and News Survey 2022, four out of five respondents have been exposed to disinformation and fake news in the past seven days, while 13% did not uh, know how frequently and only 8% stated that they were not exposed. Next slide, please. The majority of respondents feel uh, confident that the, uh, they can recognize this information. 12% feel very confident and 52% somewhat confident. Confident is distinguish, uh, distinguishing between real news and fake news, decreases with, ages, with age sorry, and increases with uh, the level of education. Next slide, please. This is uh, crucial because uh, the consequences of this information are used and we, we should be all worried about these consequences. Uh, some examples are uh, and this information affects memory and decision making, increases political polarization, provokes distrust in democratic institutions. As we saw during the lockdown uh, times, it lowers responsiveness to global problems such as COVID-19, exacerbates political or religious uh, persecution and influences elections and referenda results. Next slide, please. Regarding uh, uh, possible solutions or uh, important solutions to tackle this information, uh, research showed us uh, three main ways, the technologies, 
literacies and policy. Uh, regarding technologies, we, uh, we can uh, bet on fact-checking, uh, on integrate humans and, tech and technology in the fight. In the second area of literacies, we uh, focus on media literacy, digital literacy, and third one regarding policies, it's important to pass laws and policies to address emerging challenges, to increase transparency and to design a measurement agenda to inform targeted policies to stop creators and predators. Next slide, please, Ryan, thank you. Uh, that said, we can conclude that media literacy is crucial. So literacies as technology and policies are crucial, but uh, one, each one by itself is not the answer to tackle this information. So we need um, a global response. Next slide, please. And this global response in our idea is digital citizenship education. Uh, that said, this, this is the ability to positively and competitively, competently engage with technologies, participating actively and responsibly in society, mobilizing values, skills, attitudes, knowledge, and critical understanding, uh, and being involved in the lifelong learning process, continuously defending human rights and human dignity. This is what we are trying to do and to develop, uh, for instance, in uh, uh, Portugal and Spain now uh, through the project uh, funded by the European Commission that's called iBerryFire. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we are trying to implement the DCE temple in communities, in Portuguese communities and Spanish uh, communities. Uh, having all this in mind, so if we want to tackle this information, we use this global strategy, the main policies, the recommendation, for instance, involving all the actors, the main strategies, the strategies that uh, they prove to work, and mobilizing uh, the correct infrastructure and resources. And finally, it is key to evaluate. This is the, one of the key uh, concepts of our project now. And that's all. The, back to you, Mario. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Um, out of your presentation, I, I just noted down that this information provokes distrust in democratic institutions. So, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, that uh, governance is twofold. So, on the hand of, uh, on the side of the uh, governing bodies, I think it's their duty that make sure that the disinformation uh, is uh, not, uh, at least, uh, is not uh, uh, disseminated or it's blocked uh, somehow or checked uh, and they develop uh, some measures to, to check, uh, do the fact checking. But on the citizen side, it's that we don't produce this information. We, if you are responsible, can you imagine a word that uh, everybody Everybody has the responsibility and then we reduce and then also they contribute taking the measures or impl implementing the measures that are in place. So again, involving actors, uh, citizens as actors, uh, active participants in, in, in governance is really key. Now I will uh, turn to Olena Staislavska, who is our online moderator. And uh, are there any questions uh, from the floor, Afi, Afia, and then Lena from the from the online participants to our panel? Thank you, Murat. Uh, uh, I'll switch on my video. Uh, respectful colleagues, greetings from Poland. I'm very happy uh, to be here and thank you for inviting me to moderate the discussion. Uh, I have some questions to our presenters. Actually, uh, we heard four very different and uh, very um, rich presentations during this uh, 30 minutes. And I think uh, we would like to learn more about it. Uh, and I hope that during this five minutes of uh, uh, moderation, I will be in touch also with Afia, who is our on-site moderator. Please, Afia, 
give me the signs if there are some questions from the audience, because we really want to use this time for the discussions. Uh, but uh, I will start uh, the first question to Brian. Uh, you were talking about the guidelines for equitable partnerships, but how do you incentivize the private sector to take the guidelines on board? Uh, thank you, uh, Olena. Yes, indeed, it is a very good question. Uh, it is something that uh, we have to uh, put all our effort uh, into promotion uh, of the concept and build awareness. Uh, so I think events such as these, uh, and uh, this is a call out uh, to all potential participants, large and small, uh, so that when we think about uh, technology providers, we often think about uh, the big platforms and uh, the names that everybody is familiar with. Uh, but there are many, many different um, uh, ways in which uh, are companies and providers involved in this area. And partly uh, we, uh, we wish to incentivize uh, by uh, providing a resource that is useful. Uh, it is a common language uh, between educators and technologists. Uh, and uh, this is to, I suppose, encourage them uh, to think about the potential public good uh, that can come from this and the value uh, in terms of, that we can offer uh, by way of uh, profiling very good practices and seem to um, as, uh, disseminate that further through our networks. So that's our objective. And uh, we hope uh, that uh, through events such as these, we can attract more interest and encourage more people to look at uh, the kind of initiatives that we're sponsoring here. Thank you, Brian. So you are speaking about some small benefits to industry, small and big companies uh, by using your guidelines. But what are the benefits for educators then? Well, I think for, uh, for educators, and this in part is a response uh, to the experience that many educational institutions had uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic and across the world, uh, 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 digital transformation was hugely accelerated, uh, but, uh, uh, and we absolutely relied on uh, digitalization uh, to keep education going, to keep young people connected uh, to worlds of learning. But there were very little supports and guidance and often um, uh, the decisions had to be made as to what, uh, what can we use and what uh, uh, can, uh, uh, can we bring uh, into our learning settings uh, to make this more effective. Well, what we hope now the benefits are that we're providing more of uh, uh, signposts and uh, by uh, ensuring that there's a, again uh, this common language uh, of uh, the benefits uh, that digital technology can provide uh, to um, uh, uh, education settings uh, that uh, this also will give schools education administrators uh, greater confidence uh, in terms of you know what to look for the questions uh, to ask and how to assess uh, if uh, their uh, their uh, deployments of technology are proving effective thank you Brian so as far as I understand you claim that technology can be a great partner for education and we can all learn how to benefit it Afia, do we have any questions from the ground, please? Uh, no, for now. Please, uh, do you have any okay. question for the speakers? Thank you very much, Afia. Please don't hesitate to just interrupt me if there are any questions. Then I will uh, ask Alessandro some questions because all of us are playing video games or at least we know people who play video games and you say that video games uh, can be very educative so it can serve our purpose but can you give some concrete examples of some valuable games I'm very curious unmute yourself Alessandro can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I was thanking you, Elena. Um, now, okay, now you also can see me. Um, yes. I'll give you a few examples, very, very interesting examples. 
um, the the first one is uh, is a very recent game uh, which is called Road ninety six, which is um, an, a narrative game based in a fictionary um, nation with the, um, a dictatorship inside this nation, and you play uh, as uh, um, children or uh, very young teen teens who wants to escape the country and uh, you're basically living uh, the, the the struggles and uh, also the, the nice encounters that a uh, uh, people running uh, across uh, across the border is doing so you you will deal with the smugglers uh, you will deal with people that wants to help you or people that wants to to arrest you, like uh, like police, and it's very interesting because uh, it, it it takes uh, um, uh, topos to topos. I don't know the the in, in words uh, the word in in. Uh, it, it takes um, uh, this kind of stereotypes that mm -hmm. uh, that uh, one has in mind uh, when uh, when uh, when thinks about this very complicated issue. And then it, it, it makes really you reflect about them. Um, I really, it's a really clever, clever um, uh, title. Very, very interesting. So it's Road ninety six. Road ninety six. Yes, it's and from the then... it's from the developer of another game, which is is my second example. So the same developer, um, which is called Valiant Hearts. And it's a game uh, that puts the player in the in the steps of different people involved in the first world war uh, from different sides of the barricades also so um with the historical references uh, um, original uh, photographs uh, original documents and so uh, the player is uh, is uh, has the possibility to really uh, understand could to to could uh, the, the, to understand what is coming from fiction uh, and what is real uh, of the video game, and uh, very very interesting uh, to, for instance, in this case, teach uh, history, or uh, or also to uh, start and spark some reflection about. Uh, uh, who was right and who was wrong in a world where... Thank you very much, Alessandro. Uh, Please such complicated you uh, have yeah. in mind some more valuable games, just write us the titles in the chat because uh, I am running out of time and uh, I still have some questions to Janice and to Vitor. Janice, are you here? I think she had to leave, but Vitor is here, or maybe... Okay, uh, maybe Janice, yes, was uh, on the other meeting as well. Uh, Vitor, tell me, please, you were speaking about disinformation and how you are tackling this um, sort of digital citizenship education, but can you give some concrete examples how you are doing it in the field by digital citizenship education? Thank you very much uh, for the question, Olina. Uh, we are uh, developing uh, different projects, for instance, uh, digital citizenship education projects with very young children uh, in a community uh, uh, north of Lisbon. Uh, we started uh, focusing uh, uh, this year on the disinformation, but the idea is to organize a real digital citizenship education project, having in mind the 10 digital domains and not only disinformation. So this is the starting point, but the idea is to involve all the community. At the same time, we have another project that we train journalists, and these journalists that were trained in digital citizenship education are now working with teachers in order to develop projects with students, parents, and communities. This is these are two, uh, two projects that we are currently developing in Portugal and Spain. Thank you very much. So you are speaking about the example of uh, bringing democracy and democratic structures in the community by working on the issue that is very important for digital democracy and digital communities. Thank you very much, Victor. If you can also post some links uh, to the chat for the people who would like to, to see this example in more detail, we will be 
very thankful, but uh, I think we are running out of time and uh, my, uh, I'm giving the floor to you, Murat. Thank you, Elena. Thank you, Vitor. Thank you, Alessandro. Yes, because we have one more, one more presentation to go. And then uh, without uh, further delay, I would like to give the floor to Nazir. Uh, also uh, report uh, briefly on this session, but before that, uh, talk about cyber governance. Nazir. Okay. okay, hello everybody. Uh, so I'm Nazir from Turkey, Konya. I'm going to discuss actually two topics. One is about cyber governance uh, in the context of the recommendation and also uh, I will evaluate uh, the pre presentations by uh, my colleagues. Uh, I've tried to manage the time. First of all, uh, cyber governance, or uh, uh, some say internet governance or good cyber governance. Actually, all these discussions that you have made so far are about good cyber governance because it includes some um, good governance uh, principles. So internet governance um, is uh, actually about the uh, power because the internet is more than the codes and it is a source of power and therefore all stakeholders try to benefit and get more power in from this domain. Uh, internet governance, so good internet governance is much more about um, to uh, establish a free, safe, and sustainable uh, digital ecosystem. So each stakeholders actually, states, international organizations, uh, private companies, uh, the experts, individual citizens, they have different understanding of uh, internet governance, but the uh, approach um, of the Council of Europe is much more integrated and actually the IGF approach is also quite, um, uh, 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 have commonalities. So I, I will try to focus on the components of cyber governance, digital citizenship, citizenship education as a tool for cyber governance. And then I will go through the recommendation. So next slide, please. Uh, maybe the, the, the one after. So I have, Mm, okay, cyberspace is mm, a new domain. Uh, initially, it was considered by the states, particularly as a law politics issue. It is about the environment, entertainment, human rights, trade issues. But later on, particularly in late 2000 and the beginning of 2010, uh, with the emergence of the cyber conflicts and international relations, they start to think that it is a high politics issue. It is an issue of strategy, uh, military, and security. And cyberspace is a decentralized domain. It is an anarchic space. There is no central uh, authority that can govern. So we need a, a, a um, holistic approach to governance. And Nazli Shukri calls this domain as an as hyper anarchy because there is there is no uh, governing institutions and governing principles. Still, of course. Uh, we have some um, initiatives uh, for the governance. We have some proposals by the academicians, experts, but still uh, it is um, at the embryo level. So the next slide, please. First of all, the cyber governance is at the, uh, we can analyze at the four fourth levels, the, the global level that go through the cyber governance regimes, and then you have national level. Usually uh, it is regulated through national cybersecurity strategy documents. The institutional level, it is go through the cooperation frameworks with the other stakeholders. And the last one is the digital citizenship education for the individual level. So uh, next slide, please. Digital citizenship education is the core of cyber governance or internet governance because 
um, in cybersecurity, individual or the user is the weakest link, and it is the most fragile and the, the component of cyberspace at risk. And therefore, the, the, the uh, effective methodology to take measures is the, the digital citizenship education. And digital citizenship education um, promotes positive security that try to both provide security with the values, with the freedoms, with the human rights, not only security, and also it promotes uh, cybersecurity culture rather than securitization of the cyberspace. It's an awareness training, awareness education. It is uh, human centric, and at the same time, peace and human rights education because it tries to build up a peaceful, free, uh, and safe cyberspace. And of course, um, as it is promoted by the recommendation, human rights is the at the heart of digital citizenship education because uh, it is based on rights and responsibilities. The digital citizenship education should promote the human rights principles in democratic culture in digital domain. So recommendations help the member states to uh, review their policies, strategies, uh, in the line with the digital citizenship education of the Council of Europe. It also involves all stakeholders uh, in design, implementation, and evaluation of digital citizenship education. So it encourages their cooperation at all level the, among all stakeholders. And it is based on the integrated conceptual framework. The recommendation, next slide, please. Uh, uh, as my colleagues stressed before, um, they promote also 10 digital domain with three clusters, being online, well being online, and rights online. And these three clusters are, uh, um, and all these principles are um, supposed to be provided through digital citizenship education. And the recommendation, develop a framework. The next one, please. Uh, it is based on five basic principles. So contextual, informational, regulational, institutional, and cooperation. Contextual is much more about the access to internet, the preconditions to the access. And information is about democratic culture on the internet. Regulation is about the legal and administrative regulations. Institutional about the capacity building of the education institutions. And last one is about the cooperation uh, among all stakeholders. So uh, the uh, digital citizenship education as a source of um, knowledge for the citizens in digital domain is uh, an important component of internet governance or good cyber governance. So shall I shift to the evaluation of the uh, presentations or? I'm, I'm afraid we are running out of time. Okay. Uh, Brian, uh, do we still have time, uh, do you think, or we are just? Uh, I, I, we're just on, the, on time, so I think it's uh, to wrap up. Okay. Um, then maybe uh, maybe we will provide the reporting of the key t takeaways from this session uh, to the uh, to the organizers, and you can uh, you can download it from the IGF website later. So there is not much to say actually. You see, uh, we try to give you an overview of the Council of Europe, so work on digital citizenship education and and how it can contribute to the uh, to better or good governance of internet. And uh, again, I repeat myself, uh, not just put all the burden and then responsibility on the governing bodies, but also as citizens, we take uh, we share the responsibility and we uh, take uh, we take uh, mm, the courage to to develop our competencies and skills so that we can also uh, perform our duties. And uh, more, more than that, uh, not just performing duties, but taking responsibility and contributing to the governance. Thank you very much for your attention. And I would like to thank our uh, distinguished experts 
and also Afia uh, be helping us in Addis Ababa. It would uh, be nice if we were all there, but uh, maybe next time. And thank you for the audience in the room. Uh, have a nice afternoon.